Jean-Pierre, your work as a neuroscientist has really exemplified the power of uh, reductionism in understanding the whole neural process, starting with macromolecules, which you've pi done pioneering work on, through the neuron, through neuronal circuitry, et cetera, to get to the brain. And so reductionism, in a sense, works its way backwards uh, in that process. There are people who criticize reductionism as uh, insufficient to explain consciousness, and they use the, the requirement of emergence, that there are principles at the different levels of the hierarchy which are, in some sense, not uh, predictable from the lower levels. Um, and, and that's the definition of emergence. There's a weak emergence where it's, it's, not, it's predictable in principle, but not in practicality, and then strong emergence where it's not even a, a, a predictable in, in, uh, in principle. So how do you look upon this uh, tension, if you will, uh, or collaboration between reductionism and emergence in explaining mental activity and consciousness? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, first of all, I am not a reductionist. And second, uh, I never use the word emergence. Uh, so, <laughs> so both of my words are gone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what are you? <laughs> uh, why I, uh, I don't feel myself as a reductionist? I, actually, because reductionist, you go from the complex to the simple. Yeah, yeah. To reduce yeah. things uh, from the higher level to the lower level. And as you say yourself, I am a constructionist, mm -hmm. not reductionist. I am trying to build up complexity from simpler elements and try to see where we can go. So, uh, of course, uh, at the very lower level, as we said already, we, you cannot go very far. Uh, at a more complex uh, level of organization, you go a little bit farther and further. So, when you reach the global state of the brain, uh, then the, the question is, uh, have you reached the ultimate level? Well, uh, the thing I can say is, what is the outcome of the understanding we have of the lower levels? So I don't go further than that. Uh, either uh, we achieve uh, something of interest for the understanding of conscious processing, not consciousness, <laughs> uh, or we have not made progress. So my only concern as a scientist is to have theories and develop experiments which let us progress in the understanding of, uh, of what conscious processing is. Now, I mentioned the, the difficulty already with uh, the levels of consciousness. And as I said, many people talk about consciousness without specifying their levels. Yeah. So if they want to explain uh, the Stravinsky brain or Michelangelo <laughs> uh, simply with uh, the network of, uh, uh, of a worm, of yeah. course it's not, <laughs> it's not going to work. Yeah. So there is a, an emergence which is necessary to go from that. So uh, my view is that uh, uh, the notion of emergence is not necessary. And uh, uh, on the other hand, there is a concept which is uh, absolutely necessary to have in mind, is, is that our knowledge is limited. And that's a characteristic of science. And already present in the pre-Socratic, they knew, as I said, you cannot, by your model, exhaust the reality. You approach it. There is no absolute truth. There is a search for truth. That's what we have. And in the case of consciousness, we have to progress as much as we can using theories and experimental system to see where we can go. And I can tell you that we have still a lot to do. Yeah, yeah. That's for sure. Uh, we have not exhausted 
the uh, higher brain function in, in humans. It's a field of research for the future. You mentioned that there is no truth. We can only get closer to it. Uh, that's, of course, the name of our show, Closer to Truth. So thank yes. you very much for the, <laughs> for the plug. I agree. <laughs> yeah, anyway. the, the, and it's not the closer to the truth. We don't have the. It's just closer to truth as a, as a process. So we're aligned completely. Uh, but when you say there's no truth, it, it, it's an epistemological claim that we, we don't know what it is, but there is an ontological truth there. Just we not, may not be able to see it. it. It's not like there is no truth and everything is relative. And, no, you know. I, I, I did not say there is no truth. Right. I, I see we should avoid the word <laughs> truth and, and replace it by approach or yeah, search okay. for okay. truth. Or closer, yeah, it's a uh, progress. The search, the truth, the ideal truth would be the uh, exact uh, uh, coincidence between what we have in our brain and what is uh, lying yeah. outside yeah. our brain. So the relationship should be absolute. Yeah. Which is, uh, uh, as uh, again, Democritus said, uh, not what you expect if you have atoms in your brain which are ne necessarily a limited amount, and if you have neurons which are necessarily a limited amount, um, uh, and so on and so on. So. Uh, the, the difficulty uh, uh, for uh, uh, this uh, approach is to, to accept that uh, there are uh, aspects of the world that you don't understand. And uh, that's the origin of uh, myths, of religions and, uh, <laughs> and ideologies. You know, they have built upon the things you don't know. <laughs> and, and, uh, I like the uh, origin of uh, the human uh, being, the nature, and so on. That just that uh, genesis, for instance, <laughs> to try to understand the origin of the world. So uh, there is still uh, this uh, issue present uh, in everybody's mind. You know, you have to consider that uh, uh, some aspects of the world we still don't understand them, but we wish to understand them. Mm. You know, mm. That's a very strong statement the scientists should have, mm. is to make a progress in a knowledge of the world, mm. which is the aim of the encyclopedist mm. in, in the French <laughs> 18th century. And, um, this is a good place uh, to are, discuss we it. We are uh, at a, uh, having some kind of enlightenment <laughs> between the, the two of us, and I, I think we, we may uh, agree on that. And, uh, uh, clearly, uh, this is a difficulty because uh, uh, if you don't have, the, let's say, the uh, uh, absolute solution for climate, which is, uh, for instance, a very difficult situation uh, to evaluate scientifically, there is a scientific approach. It is limited. Uh, so uh, at that stage, and it's going to progress thanks to studies all over the world on that issue. Yeah. Now, does, does it mean... Uh, that we uh, have not the truth, well, that it's meaningless. Yeah. We are trying to do our best to understand sure. the world. I want to ask you, you say you're a constructivist building up the yes. theory as opposed to a reductionist yes. who starts at the top and yes. then just goes all the way down. I, I understand that distinction. But at the end of the day, after you finish your project and have constructed it, a reductionist can work your, his, his or her way down the same path. So isn't it not the same thing? It's just methodologically having no, done the same it's thing. No, it's not the same thing because uh, when you have a constructivist approach, it's much more humble, if I may say. Oh, okay. Uh, in the sense that you can, at the outcome, find a behavior, a property, a uh, disease, and so on and so forth. So your outcome is necessarily limited when you ah, build up. Ah, okay. When you start to re reduce, what are you going to reduce? You know, the, the whole uh, psychology of uh, <laughs> a thousand years of human being, <laughs> and so, so forth, which is uh, meaningless. You know, that uh, I don't like the, uh, the uh, reductionist approach because uh, what are you going to reduce? Okay. Uh, and uh, on, the, on the other side, when you build things, you know where you go. 
Okay. And you can necessarily find, which is one of the benefits, the limits where you are. And, and you have to go. So, I, so ahead. I, I like that, that the differentiation between constructivist and reductionist is humility. I said the word. <laughs> I like that. <laughs>